its variables, we will be regressing on binary variables. So it's probably more better to think of it as a classification problem. So the idea is we get some features and then we're trying to decide whether those individuals with those features should be of class 1 or class 2. All right, so in the class, the idea will be to understand how logistic, what logistic regression is, make a connection of logistic regression to neural networks, um, derive the gradient and the Hessian for logistic regression, because once we have the gradient, we know how to implement a learning algorithm. We'll be able to just do stochastic gradient descent. And once we have the Hessian, we can implement Newton's method. So by having the expressions for the um, gradient and the Hessian, you can just try any optimization technique. Um, and I will actually show you code for, for doing this using Newton's method. Um, Logistic regression, by the way, is very popular. Many companies out there, their fundamental classification technology is logistic regression. It's one of the most widely used techniques. So if you end up dealing with huge data sets at Google or Twitter, quite likely you will be working with logistic regression. Um, it's a very sort of fundamental model. It's not analytic in the sense that you can't find the solution for the optimum, unlike linear regression. Um, but, it's, but the gradient and the Hessian are analytic. And so it's, and moreover, as I'll argue, the cost function that you're optimizing is convex. So you're guaranteed to find a minimum. You're guaranteed to find the optimum, provided you implement your algorithm right. Um, that will be the frequentest approach to learning the parameters. And again, I remind you, the frequentest approach believes there is one true value of the parameters. And so we will try to find that single value. Um, doing optimization. I will then discuss how we to do approximate Bayesian computation. So we will introduce a prior. We'll have a likelihood and a prior that will allow us to derive a posterior distribution. But that posterior distribution will not be analytical. That is, we will not be able to come up with a closed form expression for the posterior. However, uh, what we will do is we will introduce Monte Carlo, very cool trick today. Um, that will allow us to solve um, the, the Bayesian problem, to approximate it using just sampling techniques. All right, so um, let's start with um, a simple model of uh, looks like a pyramidal cell, um, the sort of cells that you find in your, um, in your cortex. Um, the cells uh, contain uh, you can think of a cell as taking many input signals from its dendrites and then um, depending on how much excitation you have, um, you'll have a pulse coming here, a spike. Um, and depending on how, much, how many neurotransmitters you have floating between these uh, devices, um, between the connections between two cells, um, and the neurotransmitters are the sort of things that you screw up when you take drugs. So, big warning, because um, you're basically altering these connections. So, um, depending on some neurotransmitters here, um, we form um, <coughs> basically the, the, the membrane polarizes with ions, plus and negative, and that allows a pulse to be transmitted along the gap. And when all those pulses reach a certain level of excitation in the cell, then the cell fires a pulse. And we're not going to deal with pulses. So instead of thinking of dealing with pulses individually, think of a frequency modulated signal. What we do is we're going to take an average of those pulses, and that's going to give us the level of excitation of the cell. Now, that's essentially the idea of the model of McCulloch and Pitts. And this is a very simplified model of a neuron, by the way. There are neurons out there that they will have like 10 million. No, I think I'm exaggerating there, but 100,000 dendrites. So they're extremely complex. And some researchers dedicate all their lives to just study one particular form of motor neuron. So they're fairly complex objects. But um, in this abstraction of these parameter cells, the idea is you have um, D inputs, 
So let's start now abstracting this mathematically. So we have D inputs as just D attributes or D features as we've had before in linear regression. Uh, we, we add a 1 so that we can have a bias term so we can move the function up and down. And then each of these inputs gets scaled by a parameter, theta, which in the neural network language is called the synaptic weight or the weight for short. Um, you then take that vector x of all your x's, of all your individual inputs of size d by 1 and you multiply times the vector theta of size d by 1 um, and that just gives you um, a single scalar xi theta and then so essentially what we're doing there is we're just summing all the inputs so we multiply each input by a uh, weight and then we sum them all and that's essentially the same as a dot product of x and theta vectors and then depending on what that input is let's suppose if the input is here then this is the level of firing of the cell so now the cell will have this nonlinearity, which is given by and I think this will be much better with without the front lights okay so the cell will have this nonlinearity, uh, which is, has this function there in green which is like an S and because it looks like an S it's, all, it's also called the sigmoid function or the logistic function um, and that function is simply given by um, this expression here which in the next slide I'll go into a bit more detail um, but essentially if the level of excitation which is x times theta is above a certain threshold the neuron is on so that we're on the top part of the green function and if the level of excitation is below a certain threshold the neuron is off okay from a statistics perspective we will be given the data we will give him x's and y's so it's going to be a supervised learning problem and the y's will be binary zero or one given the x's and the y's our task is to compute the thetas so it's very much like linear regression the only thing is that now the y's instead of being real numbers um, these y's are now either zero or one so it's a classification problem and that's very useful like you can imagine in a search engine because one of the first tasks a search engine has to do is decide given a new message of some sort a document or a tweet or whatever it, you have to decide whether that's spam or not spam that's sort of the, the sort of the fundamental first thing you have to implement when implementing a search engine okay let's look at the sigmoid function so the sigmoid function uh, uh, is the function pi also often written as sigma of eta where eta is just the argument is 1 over 1 plus e to the minus e okay and you can also write it as e to the e to divided by e to the e to plus 1 it's an s function um, as eta goes to infinity this function asymptotes at 1 so the maximum value is 1 and as eta goes to minus infinity this function goes to zero okay so it's essentially like a gate function um, but the reason why we don't use just a gate function like this um, or off, off and on is because we will need to compute gradients of this function when we're trying to estimate theta and by having a smooth function it will be possible to compute gradients because the derivative will exist whereas here there is a problem of non-differentiability where the vertical line is okay so how do we use this device well we will be given data and the data is basically something like x1, x2 and then y so you're given a data set and that data set might be stuff like 2.3 6.2 8.1 0.9 2 and then you will get a label 
Okay, so that data is given to us. We have features, so we might have the tweets, and we have a label, which is happy face or sad face in the tweet. And our task is to be able to predict whether any tweet is a happy face or a sad face. Um, and if you can do that, then it's very easy to build a sentiment detector, and you can predict uh, who's more likely to win the elections and so on. Um, now, um, let's, what we're going to do is we're going to call pi i, which is just a sigmoid of xi times theta, the probability that the neuron is active. Okay? We're doing this by construction. We've constructed a sigmoid function to be between 0 and 1. Because it is between 0 and 1, we can interpret it as a probability. So the probability that the neuron will fire, so yi is 1 when the neuron fires, um, is given by the sigmoid of uh, the input argument xi times theta. Now, if you look at, if this is a half, this will be a half when xi times theta is equal to 0, so a plane at the origin. Um, to see this, you just take the sigmoid function, and if you substitute um, xi times theta 0, you end up with 1 over 1 plus 1, so that's a half. Okay, so again, recall that the, the sigmoid function is just 1 over 1 plus e to the minus xi theta. So xi theta is the input, and then you put it through the function 1 over 1 plus e to the minus xi theta. If xi theta is equal to 0, then the output of this function will be a half, as the picture, as the picture illustrates here. Okay, what that now gives us is a mechanism for doing classification. Because essentially, if we look at, uh, at this equation, the equation sigmoid of xi theta equal to half, which is equivalent to the function xi theta equal to zero, we see that that's just the equation of a line, the equation of a plane in general. Um, so if you have data of two classes, so these are the, the points y equal 1, and these would be the points with the label y equals 0. So this is your training data. Then the plane x times theta equal to 0 will be this guy here. And it will separate the reds from the blues, which is what we're doing. Because essentially what we're doing is, so that's the view in terms of the two inputs. Um, in 3D, if we plot this curve, p of y equal 1, given x theta, which is just equal to the sigmoid of xi theta. In 2D, this is still an S, but it's an S in 2D as shown by the figure. And now if you cut that S at a half, at height to half, that cut, as the picture illustrates, is giving you this line. So that's me cutting this function at a half. And because it's giving, and, and that cut will be exactly a half. So logistic regression gives you a linear separating uh, discriminant function. Anything to the right. When xi theta is positive, you will get class 1. When xi theta is negative, you will get class 0. In this particular case, since the line's not going through the origin, is there a third column that perhaps it? Uh, yes, that's correct. So, so recall I mentioned there would be an extra one. One of the x's is equal to one. So that's a good question. So there's an extra parameter there in order to be able to shift it. So it's through the origin in the original coordinates. Good question. Okay. So essentially, that's what logistic regression is all about. You get some data in pairs of data, x's and y's. Um, your task is to break the y's, separate the data into two, t uh, into two classes, so that if you get a new point, if all of a sudden we get a new point, say this guy over here, then we know that that point should be class 0. 
so we can classify it. Once you have that, the equation of that line, you can use the equation of, you just evaluate the line, if it's less than a half, um, sorry, if it's less than zero, then it's class zero, if it's greater, then it's class one. Okay, so now let's look at the probabilistic model of this. Um, because the y's, so just like linear regression, when we're going to assume that the inputs are given, the x's are given, so there's no uncertainty about the x's. The x's are deterministic objects, um, so there's no need to specify probability distributions on deterministic objects. But the y's, the labels, is where we have uncertainty. We don't know, we need to predict whether something is um, zero or one, whether a patient has cancer or doesn't have cancer. And that's where our uncertainty will be. Now, because the process is binary, then that the right model for binary data is not a Gaussian, but it's a Bernoulli model. It's a coin flip model. You either have cancer or you don't, depending whether it's heads or tails. And so now, if we have n patients in our data, so we've seen n patients, we've done the tests, to the ter and we figure out whether they had cancer or not. Um, we model each patient as a coin flip, as a Bernoulli model. In other words, these independent patients will have probability pi i times y i times 1 minus pi i to the 1 minus y i where again pi i is just the success probability and then 1 minus pi i is the failure probability. Now what this is saying is that this will be equal to pi i so a single term one of these guys will be equal to pi i if y i equal to 1 and it will be precisely 1 minus pi i when yi equal to zero. Okay? So that term will either be pi i or one minus pi. And the way I've written it is just a way of summarizing the two things that could happen when you have a cost, uh, when you have a toy, uh, sorry, when you have a coin flip. It, with some probability pi, it will be heads. With some probability one minus pi, it will be tails. And so this what seemingly big mathematical expression is simply doing a coin flip. Now, the other thing that we're doing in this case is instead of just letting the pi be the parameter, we're going to make pi be a function. And that function will have a parameter feet. So that's the new thing here. The new thing here is we construct in this sort of um, recursive definition of the probability. And that's what's going to be great. Because we're going to be using these very basic probability distributions like Bernoulli and Gaussian, but because we're going to over-parameterize them. So we're going to take, say, for example, a parameter, like the mean of a Gaussian, and that mean of the Gaussian will be a whole function with many parameters. And that's where the power of these methods will come in. Um, that we will be able to do very interesting modeling. In this case, pi i will be, it's essentially the success probability of a neuron of the neuron and it will take into account what the input is and uh, what the synaptic weights of the neuron are. Okay? Um, the reason why this makes sense is because pi i is guaranteed to be between 0 and 1. So by construction I chose a function that would always be between 0 and 1. So by construction we have a valid probabilistic model. So the pi i's are guaranteed to be between 0 and 1 and then the probability of success is pi, the probability of failure is 1 minus pi. If you sum those two, you get 1. So the probability of both options is 1. So, so we have a valid probabilistic model. And so now the task, so we have a likelihood. If we have a likelihood, how do we get an error function? Let's go back to the linear regression case. In linear regression our likelihood was a Gaussian. And then how did we get the least squares cost function? Minus log. Minus the log, right? So 
Here we do the same thing. So there's always this very simple relation between probabilities and cost functions, or also called error functions, risk functions. Um, we just take the negative log of the probability, and that gives us the cost function that we need to optimize. So in this case, if we take, and, and all the data as before, I mean, this y vector is still n by 1. Um, this x matrix is still um, n by d. And this vector is uh, d by 1. So it's the, the sizes of these matrices just as in linear regression. The only thing that has changed from linear regression to logistic regression is that the y's are binary instead of Gaussian. Everything else is the same. So um, if we now, I mean, technically speaking, is n times d plus 1. Because we, uh, we introduced this extra theta naught. But whether it's d or d plus 1, is, is just remember that there is an extra bias term. Now, if we take the negative log of p of oops, p of y given x and theta, we get our cost function, our objective function, which for some reason we always write as j of theta. And I don't know why we use the j. Capital J is always used. No idea. Good question. If any of you find out, let me know. Um, J is a Yeah, sometimes you use E, sometimes you use J. Sorry, H, like Hamiltonian. Comes from the control literature. Oh, cool. Well, who knows? It's just an arbitrary letter. Um, and if we do that, um, if you take the log of the likelihood, um, the log of the product just becomes a sum from i equal 1 to n. And then you have the log of pi i to the power yi, so it's just yi log of pi i plus 1 minus yi log 1 minus pi i. Now, what does this cost function remind you of? Something we've seen in this course before. Entropy. entropy. In this case, it's the entropy between y and pi. So it, it, it receives the name of cross entropy, because it's across two quantities. So this is indeed called the cross entropy. So does this make sense? Does it make sense to minimize this function? <laughs> I see one nod. Why wouldn't it make sense? Or why would it make sense? You want to minimize your uncertainty? Yeah. Entropy is just a measure of uncertainty. Our goal when learning is always to minimize our uncertainty about the world. We want to understand the world. Understanding is information. Information is the opposite of uncertainty. And information, indeed, is the finest, the opposite of uh, entropy. So by minimizing the uncertainty, we will learn something. So everything here makes sense. If you think in terms of cost, you would have naturally arrived at this cross entropy. If you hadn't thought of probability at all, you would have arrived at this quantity. But you can see that by doing this negative log, there's a very natural mapping between probabilities and 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 objective functions that make sense. Now, this is now your homework question. Um, I'm going to ask you to prove the following thing. You're going to take that cost function, that j of theta, and you're going to differentiate it with respect to theta, and you will get this expression. And that expression is the expression for the gradient. So if you're doing now if you're learning your parameters, if you're doing gradient descent, then your gradient descent will just basically be theta t plus 1 is equal to theta t 
minus whatever the learning rate is that you use and then you just substitute the expression for the gradient x transpose pi of theta t because pi is a function of theta t remember that pi is equal to the sigmoid 1 over 1 plus e to the minus theta x and then you put here um, minus y t So that's essentially will be your uh, that will be your gradient. Or oh, this will be x t if you take the if you take the online gradient. If you do the patch gradient, you just don't you consider the sum over all t's. Okay. So and and it makes sense to follow the gradient because if your predictions remember the pi is your prediction pi is equal to your estimate of the probability that y equal 1 given x and theta which is equal to 1 over 1 plus e to the minus x theta um, pi is your prediction of y being 1 if y so so pi is your prediction y is the label so when the two agree when pi and y are the same then the gradient is 0 so if you, if you can predict the data, if you can predict the labels, that means you, there's nothing else to learn. So the gradient should stop um, pushing, moving your parameters. So your parameters become stagnant because you've learned. Um, if, however, your pi's and your y's are very different, so the, the gradient then will be, um, um, say, 1 um, here, then your thetas will change a lot. So this makes perfect sense. As soon as we learn, the theta stop changing. Um, before we learn, the thetas will still um, uh, incur changes. Um, we can proceed by taking the second derivative, and then we get that expression for the Hessian. Your homework is basically to derive these two expressions. So that's a sort of very simple sort of algebraic derivation. Um, in your homework, I'm also going to ask you to look at the properties of H. One property is that it's positive definite. So you're going to have to look. If you've seen what positive definite matrix is before, it's fine. If not, just look it up on Wikipedia. It has a very nice definition. It basically means that its eigenvalues are positive. And um, the conclusion of uh, having a positive definite uh, second derivative of the second derivative being uh, positive is that it's saying that we have um, something with this, the we have a convex function we have a function that's always that doesn't have like an inflection point so there's a single minimum and that's a very powerful thing because that means that when you do the learning algorithm you will find that minimum but we saw that Newton's method only required one step to find a minimum in linear regression in this case it will actually require several steps but because this function is not exactly quadratic. Later on, I will show you the picture. Okay, so the Newton method <coughs> for logistic regression has a special name. It's called the IRLS algorithm or iterative reweighted least squares. And essentially, um, once you have the expressions for the gradient and the Hessian that you derive in your homework, um, the Newton method is just um, um, theta minus the inverse of the Hessian times the gradient. And then if you substitute the expressions for um, the gradient and the Hessian there, you end up with this type of expression. Um, and that is the iterative reweighted least squares problem. And the name comes from the fact that we're iterating what seems to be the solution of uh, so a digit iteration we're solving a least squares problem. And that least squares problem has a weighting matrix which is S. So this is very much like in collaborative filtering. You had a weighting matrix there, a confidence C. And so this is exactly the same sort of set. If you were solving that collaborative filtering at each iteration, um, um, so this weighted 
least squares problem at each iteration, you would essentially have arrived at this algorithm. But I think the idea of specifying a likelihood, taking the negative log, differentiating to get the gradient Hessian, is sort of much more natural. It's also the approach that you would use for any problem in machine learning, not just for this model, but for any other model. When we do neural networks, we will follow exactly the same recipe. We will write the likelihood, we will find a derivative, and that will give us the learning algorithm. So learning in this case is just follow the gradients or follow the gradients weighted by the Hessian. And uh, I've put the code in the slides, which I will make available this afternoon on the website. And um, you know, you can just cut and paste and code it and test it. But um, I mean, the point here just being that implementing this is very simple. That's the logistic function. And then the algorithm is just a few steps. These algorithms end up being really simple to implement. All right, but now I want to switch gears and, and talk about um, a different way of doing learning, um, and that's the Bayesian way. So in the Bayesian way, we still use a likelihood, like in frequentist learning, but we also had to specify a prior on the parameters. Um, so for linear regression, we had a Gaussian likelihood, and we used a Gaussian prior. And then you did that exercise of completing squares in your homework, and you showed that the posterior is also Gaussian. We were able to do everything by hand. In this case, we will not be able to do it by hand. But if you do manage to do it by hand, you are likely to get a big uh, paper, you know, best paper award <laughs> at some conference, if not an even bigger award. Um, when we write the likelihood, let's assume that we um, uh, adopt the same prior. In this case, our posterior, uh, the same prior as in we did for all linear regression, that is. That is, we're going to assume that our thetas a priori are Gaussian. The thetas are continuous, so we're going to assume that they come from a multivariate Gaussian, and that multivariate Gaussian has some mean mu. Typically, that mu is zero. When we did ridge regression, and, and we said that rich, if we take the log of the prior, we get this theta transpose theta, which was our regularized and rich regression. So here it's the same thing. So um, the posterior okay, and I'm going to assume that uh, for short, I'm going to call the data D. And that will consist of all the, all the x1, y1, all the way up to x and y n pairs. Okay, x is a vector, y is just a zero one value. And so the posterior, which is the probability of theta given all the data in the training, um, that's just going to be equal to the likelihood p of y given x comma theta times the prior <coughs> and the, we should divide it by p of y to get a valid uh, distribution we should normalize it but we won't be able to normalize it and the reason why we can't normalize it is because when you multiply those two expressions if you sum over y, the y's are binary, and there are um, that sum would end up having um, size. Sorry, um, so we have these y's that are so we have this y's that are binary with this expression. Um, when you multiply this term times this term, which is essentially the likelihood times the prime. If you were to try to integrate out theta in order to obtain p of uh, y given x, um, that, that integral is intractable. We don't know how to do that integral by hand. Okay. So the problem is that p of theta given d 
requires it requires that we compute p of y given x in order to normalize it and p of y given x oops p of y given x is equal to the integral of p of y given x and theta times p of theta d theta so the, the denominator is the sum over all the possible values of the numerator so to make sure that it sums to 1 um, but we don't know how to do this integral in practice there's no known analytical way of solving that the integral if we can't solve the integral and that's there lies the bottleneck of being able to do Bayesian learning in practice is solving that integral in general solving that integral is on a computational cl class called sharp P and that's sort of the equivalent of NP hard so we would take an exponential amount of time to solve it we would require more time than the number of years that the Sun has ahead of itself of, uh, of lifetime so since we can't compute this normalization constant p of y given x we cannot compute this exactly all we can do is try to approximate it up to proportionality okay. now I'm going to next teach you a trick that allows us to compute those integrals not exactly but approximately that trick is the Monte Carlo trick and it's one of the most useful tricks out there and in fact if you want to compute the, the volume of a convex body in high dimensions and that usually happens to be very useful for many problems um, then the only known method that can do it in polynomial time the only approximate approximation of that volume um, in polynomial time is provided by the method that I'm going to describe next by the Monte Carlo method so Monte Carlo is sort of one of the greatest inventions of the last century um, oh one more integral that's of interest so computing the normalization constant is an, a problem of interest another one that's of interest is computing the predictive distribution so the predictive distribution so so we have our data D equal basically all your X's and all your Y's and we have N pairs of them then given a new point Xn plus 1 we want to predict n plus 1 so for a basin the way to make a prediction is to write down the probability of y n plus 1 given the new point and the data so that's the distribution that a basin would want what's the probability of y n plus 1 given all the evidence I've had in the past and given the new input for a Bayesian that function does not depend on parameters so frequentists would just say that that's a particular it's a parameter times x so it's, and it's a single parameter but Bayesians believe that you should integrate out the effect of the parameters and the way you integrate out the effect of the parameters is by the operation of marginalization so we sum over all the possible values of theta that's what the integral says okay and now we can do a further simplification by doing conditional probability so I'm going to take this joint probability of y n plus 1 and theta and I'm going to break it into product of a conditional distribution and the marginal distribution for theta so in other words I'm going to rewrite this as p of um, in other words I'm using the rules of p of a and b is equal to p of a given b times p of b and I'm also using the rule the probability of b is equal to the sum over all the a's of p of a and b 
The top identity is called conditioning, the bottom identity is called marginalization. And so I can rewrite this as P of Yn plus 1 given theta, comma Xn plus 1, comma D, times P of theta given Xn plus 1, comma D, given theta. And I'm going to simplify this. <coughs> now, theta encapsulates the information about the world. I have some input x and uh, I've got some theta, but once I, know, once I know theta and I know my input xn plus 1, theta provides a summary of all the previous data. That's the idea of learning that my weights in my brain, they have a memory of everything that happened before. So I don't need, in order to predict the future, I don't need to go and bring back the previous data. I just need to look at the weights in my brain. Um, the idea is theta summarizes the information about D. So we can drop this D. Okay, because once we know, once we know theta, theta's the model, we don't need to keep the data. You know, we, we start with some training data, we learn the parameters. Like if you, if you are doing linear regression, once you fit the line to the point, that equation of the line tells you everything about the problem. You don't need to keep track of the data, the points. So we can discard the points. And so we can rewrite this as the integral of P of Y n plus 1 given theta and xn plus 1 times the posterior which is p of theta given. Now when you, um, your posterior, your theta given d was computed before you had access to xn plus 1 and because the posterior requires the likelihood um, yn plus 1, um, this xn plus 1 this deterministic signal doesn't do anything to it. And so we arrive at the standard expression that Bayesians use for prediction. When Bayesians predict, they essentially take the likelihood of the point, of the new point, and they just weight that by every possible value of theta. This guy here is simply pi n plus 1 to the y n plus 1 times 1 minus pi n plus 1 to the 1 minus y n plus 1. This guy here is as in the previous page. It's that the product of that likelihood and that gas. We of course don't know it's normal. We don't actually know it's normalization constant. But we will be able to compute this integral we will be able to compute a solution even though we don't know the normalization constant of this distribution. Even if we only know the numerator, we will come up with a very cool trick uh, to solve this problem. Okay, and of course pi n plus 1 in this expression is just 1 over 1 plus e to the minus x n plus 1 times theta just like before. It's still the logistic function as before. Okay, so that's essentially the idea of a Bayesian. A Bayesian takes, says the predictions will be given by the likelihood and then each prediction will be weighted by how probable it is. And how probable is measured according to the posterior distribution which is the quantity that takes into account prior information and the, the, the training data. Okay, so how do we solve this integral? How do we approximate? We're going to start using this trick called Monte Carlo and I'm going to introduce it with some simple problems. Um, what is, imagine that you, this square essentially was a complete covering of this room or this wall and it's the unit square. Um, and suppose you were bandaged and you were throwing darts at, at this wall. What would be the probability 
that your dart would hit the red area. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Now, if we have, if the red area is a circle, what would the probability be of hitting it? Just pi r square, the, the area of the circle. Um, and this kind of sort of starts bringing in something interesting because the way we measure area seems to be related to probability. And indeed, probability is just a measure of certainty. Um, in fact, some people call it measuring sort of probability, especially because of this reason. Now, what if I have a funny shape? How do you compute the probability that you hit the red area? Integration. Pardon? By integration. By integration. So, and what is integration? Like if you remember Simpson's rule and so on when you introduce derivatives, so in, in integrals, what you do is you break the area in a very fine grid and then if the little block is red or is mostly red, you count it as a one and if, if it's not, you count it as a zero. And so the probability is just the area of the red guy, which is the number of red boxes, divided by the total number of boxes. And so you will make errors at the boundary. So what we do is we make those boxes very tiny. Um, here is the problem with this approach. If you're in 1D, you need n boxes. If you're in 2D, you need n squared boxes. Anyone want to take a guess how many boxes you need in 3D? n cubed, 4D, 100D. Okay, so now if your number of parameters in logistic regression is 100, and that's, or even if it's just 13 as in your um, data before, um, you soon run into a problem. Because if you're going to do discretization to estimate integrals, um, you're going to have to be integrating over this exponential size. Okay, so the, this thing is called also the, so the curse of dimensionality. If you want to estimate uh, probabilities by doing just deterministic grids, you have to deal with an in increasing exponential number of such cells. And so that's not a tractable method. Um, the way around this, oh, what would be the uh, way around this? Let's first see if any of you has an idea. Random sampling. Random sampling. And random sampling is essentially throwing darts. So the solution is exactly what I suggest in the beginning. Um, you cover your eyes, you throw darts at the, at the wall, and then you count how many darts fell inside, and the number of darts inside divided by the total number of darts that you threw at the wall, that gives you an estimate of the area. It's an extremely simple idea, but it's extremely effective as well. So in this case, probably it will be four-fifths. How do you get a better estimate? You just keep throwing more darts. Um, that's essentially the Monte Carlo method. Um, it goes back to ancient Greece where it was used to compute pi. Um, in terms of publications, published works, one of the first times it's mentioned is in a paper by um, a guy that used to work for Guinness, the, the beer manufacturer, and he Guinness does not allow its, or did not allow at the time, um, its employees to publish. And so he invented a, a name for himself. He called himself Student. And, um, and the paper was about the student T distribution, which is a sort of a distribution we use for robust analysis. And that's how that distribution was, came to be. And he used the Monte Carlo um, method to study the, the, the student T distribution. When it really took off was in the 50s, and the 40s and the 50s, 
And in fact, the first ever published paper in Monte Carlo was in 1949 um, by two guys called Metropolis and Ulla. Um, and what drove it was that people were trying to compute probabilities. And they wanted to compute what's the probability that a particle diffusing through some medium will reach the end. And that kind of probability is equivalent to computing the, if you can norm, compute the normalizing constant, you can compute basically the, the time that it will take this particle to hit the other thing. And that's sort of a key step in, in the construction of these um, devices that produce beautiful clouds but that have devastating consequences. What they used to do, those calculations, uh, was devices that look like this, computers. In those days, those computers did not have the architecture like the one, the architecture you've been taught in school, like, uh, you know, CPU and memory and so on. Um, but in, to program in those days would be to do what these ladies are doing here. Um, you would be plugging wires from one side, plugging wires on the other side. So when you when you're programming homework three in front of your nice laptop, <laughs> just remember how much worse it was. <laughs> and this job was so tedious, and there'd be so many wires hanging around um, that um, um, that a guy called von Neumann decided to sort out the situation, and he invented the sort of devices that you guys are using right now in front of your computers. So they were doing these Monte Carlo simulations, and this was just too much work to do it this way. Clary von Neumann, I don't know if she's one of these ladies, but uh, that was von Neumann's wife. She was one of the first programmers. Yeah, in those days, it was women who were the programmers. <laughs> so <laughs> the world, through its biases and so on, uh, has somewhat oscillated. Um, most of the people that work on the, the Monte Carlo method initially uh, were physicists, and there were uh, metropolis, Ulam, uh, Polish mathematician, very famous mathematician, Enrico Fermi, who is also a big physicist from Italy, and of course, um, one of the fathers of computer science, von Neumann, one of the fathers of game theory, and quantum mechanics notation, etc. <clears throat> Here is the method of von Neumann. Um, and this method appears in a letter that he wrote to a friend. And, and in the method, he, when he described the method to a friend, he wrote it in steps, step one, step two, step three. And he put numbers in those steps. And he, at the end he says, I have reason to believe that one day our mechanical devices, i.e. computers, will be able to understand this type of instructions. Um, it's kind of an interesting sort of the initial thought. This is probably the method we're going to look at is what sort of gave rise to people thinking about how to write the first program ever. Okay, so let's, uh, in an abstract sense, all the problems we're trying to solve are integrals of some arbitrary function, I'm just going to call it f of x, with respect to some posterior distribution. Okay, and x is usually the parameter. We've been using theta up to now for that parameter. But I'm just going to make this sort of very abstract. This is the quantity we're trying to estimate. And we want to try to estimate this integral for an arbitrary f in an arbitrary p of x given date. Um, the way we do this is uh, we assume that we can draw random samples from the distribution. So that's going to be the requirement. We will not know how to normalize the distribution, but we will assume that we can draw random samples from this distribution. If we can draw random samples from the distribution, we'll be able to approximate the integral. Okay, how do we draw random samples from distribution? Let's assume that the distribution was binary. So how do you draw binary random samples? If I tell you I have a distribution that has probability of half, how would you generate data? Exactly. So 
the tricks that I've taught you before. You generate uniform random variables, you build a cumulative, and so on. Or you just take a coin and you go and you, if it's one, it's put a one, if it's zero, you put a zero, and so on. So that's how we sample. We just imagine. Sampling is essentially imagining. Close your eyes, see things in your head. A white unicorn flying over a rainbow. And that's drawing a sample of images for of reality in your head. So we draw a sample from distribution. If the distribution was Gaussian, I've also told you how to deal with a Gaussian distribution. You sample uniform, that gives you samples from univariate Gaussians, and by tracking the products of univariate Gaussians, you can build samples from a multivariate Gaussian. However, the distribution that we need to deal with here is the product of a Gaussian times this Bernoulli distribution, which is the problem that we have in logistic regression. And I do not know how to draw samples from that distribution. But we'll come to that soon. We have a fix for that. But again, here is the idea. If you, if you had some arbitrary distribution, P of X given data, and if you drew samples XI from that posterior, and here are the samples, simulating basically means, or imagining or hallucinating basically means, you will hallucinate more where there is higher probability. So you'll draw that variable more often. So you get more samples where the probability is higher. And if you then approximate the, you use a histogram on those samples, you get an approximation of the true posterior. Okay, so the idea is you draw samples and then you just do counting, because that's what a histogram is. You just, you bin the data and then you count how many samples fall in each bin. And if you do that, then this histogram will be an approximation of the true distribution. And the more samples you draw, the better that estimate will be. Now, if, if we replace this guy here with a histogram, which is just a bunch of spikes, then this integral can just be written as a sum. Okay, because the integral of a function times a spike, is the, it will be zero everywhere except where the spike occurs. And where the spike occurs, the value of the function is, well, the value of the function where the spike occurs. So that's a standard property of Dirac or delta functions as they're known. And so, so we're able to com change this expectation with respect to the posterior with the sample average. Okay? And we do this all the time. This is how we compute the mean of a distribution. The mean of, um, we believe this because we flip a coin a hundred times, and if we want to know the probability of hedge, it's just sum the number of times it was heads divided by the total number of coin tosses. So the empirical sum gives us an estimate of the true expectation, uh, which, is a prob which is an integral. Okay. So that's the Monte Carlo method. The Monte Carlo method just basically says, if you have to solve an integral, draw samples from a distribution, and then using those samples, replace the integral by a sum. And that sum is only over the number of samples. And if your number of samples typically is about 10,000 or 1,000, then that sum can be done very quickly in a computer. The only thing that remains now is for us to figure out how we draw these samples from an arbitrary distribution. Now enters the method of von Neumann. Von Neumann argued the following. He said, in general, we need to solve an integral. That integral is over some function <coughs> of theta, some f of theta, with respect to some distribution, p of theta given data, d theta. And for example, for logistic regression, f of theta it's just equal to 1 over 1 plus e to the minus x theta to y times 1. Okay, so for logistic regression, that would be the quantity we would need 
because if we had that quantity, that would essentially, uh, going back, that would give us a way of approximating this integral by 1 over n sum over i equal 1 to n p of y n plus 1 given theta i comma x n plus 1. Okay. So if I were to draw samples from the posterior, I would be able to re change the integral for that sum. And that sum is what I would use to predict. Note that that's very similar to what a random forest does. You just take an average of predictors. So you can think of each of these guys, the likelihood, is, which are the frequentest predictors, um, as just a single predictor. If you do maximum likelihood, you, you don't use an ensemble. You just have one guy. And essentially what you do is you find the best theta, and your prediction is just p of y n plus 1 given the best theta and x n plus 1. But if you're Bayesian, what you do, instead of just believing there is one single best theta, um, and a lot of problems in practice, usually there's two hypotheses. So like if I'm, if I'm tracking a plane, for example, in warfare, what, plan, what planes do is they throw flames to confuse the radar. And so what they're doing there is they're always creating multiple hypotheses as to where they might be located. And if your radar doesn't understand that, um, then if your radar just follows one spike, usually that plane makes that flame very bright so that the radar follows it. And if the radar forgets that there's another hypothesis and believes only in a single parameter, then the radar will get lost because it will follow the decoy. And then the decoy disappears and it's confused, doesn't know what's going on. But if it maintains multiple hypotheses, one hypothesis will go down in probability and then the other one will go up in probability. So it keeps track. And I'm, I mean, this, this is sort of used in warfare, but it's also for image tracking in civilian applications. It's also a problem that happens a lot. People go behind something. Um, there's multiple hypotheses of what could happen. That's why the peekaboo with children works so well. Um, so we maintain several hypotheses. We have several predictors. And then we just average those predictors. Okay. So if the single predictor was a tree, then you just take the sums of the three predictions to generate a full prediction. Go ahead. Um, do you generate the, the, the eyes every time, or do you use the same ones every set? Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to the, the 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 flow will be as follows. Um, we're going to take all the data, the training data. From the training data, we're going to simulate the theta eyes, okay, because the posterior is built on the training data. So we're going to create the theta eyes. And once we generate the n, capital N, theta i's, we're done. We freeze. And then at prediction, we use those n, theta i's. So for any x, n plus 1 that you give me, any new test, I will use my stored thetas to generate a new prediction. There is a variant of this method that deals with the case where thetas change over time. And that's essentially a particle fault, which follows straight from what we're about to derive. But I'm not going to cover that today. If anyone is interested in particle filters, just ask me in my office hours. And I'll go, I'll go over it. OK, so, <clears throat> so that's the setup. So if we can solve this integral, we can solve this. But of course, the method, I'm going to use f of theta, because the method is much more general. It's not just for logistic regression, but it also applies to neural networks. You know, all sorts of probabilistic models. So, so what we're going to do, since we do not know how to sample from p of theta, what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce, I'm going to do the following trick. I'm going to introduce q of theta. And this q of theta <coughs> excuse me, will be a distribution from where it's easy to sample. So for example, q of theta could be just a Gaussian, the zero mean and some covariance. Okay? I'm going to construct that by hand. 
And you might wonder what should sigma be and so on. Um, I'll come to that question soon. Um, but let's assume we, I have a Q of theta that's Gaussian. And the advantage of having a Q of theta that's Gaussian is that I can sample from a Gaussian. So I know how to generate samples using Python or lambda from a Gaussian. And so what von Neumann did next is he rewrote this as f of theta times p of theta given d divided by q of theta times q of theta d theta. Very simple trick. So multiply and divide by q of theta. In other words, this becomes f of theta. The ratio of p of theta to q of theta we call w of theta. And the w here means a weight. And this is called importance weight. And if you can draw samples theta i from q of theta, if you can simulate from a Gaussian distribution, then you can approximate this as 1 over n sum from i equal 1 to n of f of theta i times w of theta i. So you draw samples from another distribution and you reweight them. And by reweighting them, you get the right uh, approximation. It's an extremely simple trick. There's a catch in Bayesian, and this is often used, for example, in your comp in computer graphics. If you want to simulate light and so on, um, usually you use some other source and you reweight in order to get sort of light coming from behind, sort of under the windowsill or something like that. So very fine light in big space. There is a catch to it for the uh, logistic regression case. And the catch is that we do not, this requires that we evaluate W of theta. So this requires that we know the normalization constant. But we do not know the normalization constant. That was one of the problems we had. We don't know how to compute P of theta exactly. Um, however, we can do the following thing. Actually, I've run out of space. Let me just do one thing. I'm going to generate one more slide here on the fly. OK, so our problem is we don't know how to evaluate P of theta. So instead, because Essentially, we knew that p of theta given d was equal to p of basically the data given theta times the prior divided by p of d. But we don't know what p of d is. And so what we do, or for short, we usually write this as p of d given theta times p of theta divided by z, or say g of theta divided by z. So we know how to evaluate g of theta. Our problem is we don't know how to compute z, because z requires that we solve an integral. z is the integral of g of theta, d theta. And we don't know how to solve that integral for logistic regression. So what we do then is the following. So if you have the integral of f of theta times p of theta given d, d theta, you again introduce this q distribution. So first we take z out of the integral, because z is not a function of theta. And so we write this as f of theta times g of theta theta and this is just equal to f of theta 
times g of theta uh, d theta divided by the integral of g of theta d theta which is z <coughs> and that's equal to the integral of f of theta g of theta divided by q of theta where q of theta is again our friendly distribution like the Gaussian I'm sorry if my voice has <laughs> gone down um, starting to run out of it and then we do the same thing in the denominator f of theta um, g of theta oops sorry no f of theta just g of theta divided by q of theta and then q of theta d theta and then the next thing we do is we draw samples from our friendly distribution and we can do that even beforehand and then all this gets approximated by a mod the ratio of two Monte Carlo estimates and that's our solution to logistic regression <coughs> when you do this um, for probabilities when you do logistic regression you will essentially um, have something like some prior distribution in this case the prior is Gaussian and then we will have a likelihood when you plot the likelihood of logistic regression you will find that it's not symmetric one tail is heavy so one tail is much higher than the other tail the case much more in one side but it still has a unique maximum so when you do maximum likelihood this would have been the theta maximum likelihood is the maximum of the likelihood the posterior combines the prior and the likelihood when I do important sampling I draw samples from the Q distribution and usually you pick a broad Q distribution that includes the entire support of the posterior you draw samples from the Q distribution reweight them that gives you a Monte Carlo or a histogram approximation of the posterior and in addition once you have this histogram approximation you can for the compute the predictive distribution we just get samples from P and we, that allows us to approximate the probability of Y being 1 or 0 and it's a binary case because Y is binary so you get a histogram like this and that's the Bayesian way of doing um, this is I mean I've covered a lot but essentially this is the Bayesian way of solving uh, all sorts of statistical methods the Bayesian problem will always be one of not being able to solve the integrals and using Monte Carlo to approximate um, those integrals um, I think Bobak has your homeworks there so if you want just go to him Thank you.